Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the third service in the Holy Three Days, the Holy Three Days of Holy Week, which uh, come to fruition on this night of Easter Saturday. We welcome you to join us with the worship guide that has been provided in an email to those members of the congregation who are on our email list. You can also find the worship guide for this service on our website, www.redeemerramsey.org. This service marks the culmination and height of the sacred triduum, the holy three days of the church year. Tonight, we celebrate the redemption of all people by Jesus Christ. We move from darkness to light, mourning to rejoicing, and death to life as we keep vigil for the return of our Lord in all his resurrected and ascended glory. This is the first service of the resurrection of Jesus. May the joy of Christ be yours tonight and always. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Sisters and brothers in Christ, on this most holy night, when our Savior Jesus Christ passed from death to life, we gather with the church throughout the world in vigil and prayer. This is the Passover of Jesus Christ. Through light and the word, we proclaim Christ's death and resurrection, share Christ's triumph over sin and death, and await Christ's coming again in glory. Let us pray. Eternal God, in Jesus Christ you are given the light of life to all the world. Bless us and increase in us a desire to shine forth with the brightness of Christ's rising until we feast at the banquet of eternal light through the Son of Righteousness, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The light of Christ, rising in glory, dispel the darkness of our hearts and minds. The light of Christ, thanks be to God. The light of Christ, thanks be to God. The light of Christ, Thanks be to God. Rejoice now all heavenly powers, sing choirs of angels, Exalt in all creation around God's throne. Jesus Christ is risen. Celebrate the divine mysteries with exaltation. And for so great a victory, sound the trumpet of salvation. Rejoice, O earth, in shining splendor radiant in the brightness of your King. Christ has triumphed, glory fills you, darkness vanishes forever. Rejoice, O Holy Church, exalt in glory, 
the risen Savior shines upon you. Let the place resound with joy, echoing the mighty song of all God's people. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that with full devotion of heart and mind and voice we should praise the invisible God and the only Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who by his precious blood redeemed us from bondage to the ancient sin. For this indeed is the Paschal feast in which, in which the true Lamb is slain, by whose blood the doorposts of the faithful are made holy. This is the night in which in ancient times you delivered our forebears, the children of Israel, and led them dry shod through the sea. This is the night in which the darkness of sin has been purged away by the rising brightness. This is the night in which all who believe in Christ are rescued from evil and the gloom of sin, are renewed in grace and are rejoined to holiness. This is the night in which, breaking the chains of death, Christ arises from hell in triumph. O holy night, truly blessed, in which alone was worthy to know the time and the hour in which Christ arose again from hell. This is the night of which it is written, the night is as clear as the day, and then shall my night be turned into day. The holiness of this night puts to flight the deeds of wickedness, washes away the sins, restores innocence to the fallen, and joy to those who mourn. Cast out hate, brings peace, and humbles earthly pride. Therefore, in this night of grace, receive, O God, our praise and thanksgiving for the light of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, reflected in the burning of this candle. We sing the glories of this pillar of fire, the brightness of which it is not diminished, even when its light is divided and borrowed. This is the night in which heaven and earth are joined, things human and things divine. We therefore pray to you, O Lord, that this candle burning to the honor of your name will continue to vanquish the darkness of night and be mingled with the lights of heaven. May Christ the morning star find it burning, that morning star who never sets that morning star who, rising from the grave, faithfully sheds light on the whole human race. And we pray, O God, rule, govern, and preserve with your continual protection 
your whole church, giving us peace in this time of our Paschal rejoicing. Through the same Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. In this most holy night, our Savior Christ the Lord broke the power of death and by His resurrection brought life and salvation to all creation. Let us praise the Lord, for He truly keeps His word. The Son of Righteousness has dawned upon us who have sat in darkness and in the shadow of death. Let us listen now to the history of our salvation with ears and hearts opened to the Spirit of God. Amen. A reading from Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from darkness. God called the day the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, Let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky, and there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters were gathered together. He called seas and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation plants yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. And God said, Let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let there be signs and seasons for days and years, and let there be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm and every wing burned of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters of the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind cattle and creeping things, and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. And God made the wild, wild animals of the earth of every kind, and the cattle of every kind, and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over cattle, and over the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, 
be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and the, over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of the earth. And every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. Please follow along as we read Psalm 136 responsively. God, mercy endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, for the Lord is good, for God's mercy endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for God's mercy endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for God's mercy endures forever. Who alone does great wonders, for God's mercy endures forever. Who by wisdom made the heavens, for God's mercy endures forever. Who spread out the earth upon the waters, for God's mercy endures forever. Who made the great lights, for God's mercy endures forever. The sun to govern the day, for God's mercy endures forever. The moon and the stars to govern the, govern the night, for God's mercy endures forever. Who remembered us in our low estate, for God's mercy endures forever. And rescued us from our enemies, for God's mercy endures forever. Who gives food to all creatures, for God's mercy endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven, for God's mercy endures forever. God's mercy endures forever. Almighty God, you wonderfully created the dignity of human nature and yet more wonderfully restored it. In your mercy, let us share the divine life of the one who came to share our humanity, Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Amen. A reading from Exodus chapter 14. As Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites looked back, and there were the Egyptians, Egyptians advancing on them. In great fear, the Israelites cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt? Let us alone, and let us serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians who you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to keep still. Then the Lord said to the Moses, Why do you cry out to me? Tell the Israelites to go forward. But you lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, and the Israelites may go into the sea on dry ground. Then I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them, and so I will gain glory for myself over Pharaoh and all his army, his chariots and his chariot drivers. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained glory for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots and his chariot drivers." The angel of the Lord, who was going before the Israelite army, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from the front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. 
And so the clouds came and there was darkness and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by its strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on gr dry gra ground, the waters forming a wall for them on the right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord, in a pillar of fire and cloud, took down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot we wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, let us flee from the Israelites, for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depths. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Then the prophet Miriam, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out with her with tambourines and with dancing, and Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Horse and rider, he has thrown into the sea. We will read Exodus chapter 15 responsibly. I will sing to the Lord who has triumphed gloriously, throwing the horse and rider into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my might and has become my salvation. This is my Lord, this God I will praise, my Father's God, this God I will exalt. You blew with your wind, the sea covered them, they sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in splendor, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. In your steadfast love, you led the people whom you redeemed. You guided them by your strength to your holy abode. You brought them in and planted them on the mountain of your own possession, the place, O Lord, that you made your abode, the sanctuary, O Lord, that your hands have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. O God, whose wonderful deeds of old shine forth even to our own day. By the power of your mighty arm, you once delivered your chosen people from slavery under Pharaoh, a sign for us of the salvation offered to everyone by the water of baptism. Grant that all the peoples of the earth may partake in the salvation of the Israelites and together dance on the safe side of the sea. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. A reading from Isaiah, chapter 55. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you that have no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good and delight yourself in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen, so that you may live. I will, make you, I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, my sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that you do not know shall run to you. Because of the Lord your God, O Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. 
Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord so that he may have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my mouth be that goes out with, from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Please join us in reading Isaiah chapter 12 responsively. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my might and has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And you will say in that day, give thanks to the Lord. Call on God's name. Make known the deeds of the Lord among the nations. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be known in all the earth. Shout aloud and sing for joy, O royal Zion, for great is your midst, is the Holy One of Israel. Holy God, you created all things by the power of your word, and you renew the whole earth by your spirit. Give now the water of life to all who thirst for you, that rejoicing in your covenant of mercy, we may bring forth abundant fruit through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. A reading from Daniel, chapter 3. King Nebuchadnezzar made a golden statue whose height was 60 cubits and whose width was 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. The king Nebuchadnezzar sent for the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to assemble and come to the dedication of the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces assembled for the dedication of the statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. When they were standing before the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and entire musical ensemble, you are to fall down and worship the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, as soon as all the people heard the sound of the horn, pyre, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and entire musical ensemble, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshipped the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Accordingly, at the time of certain Chaldeans came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, pyre, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and entire musical ensemble shall fall down and worship the golden statue, and whoever does not fall down and worship shall be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no heed to you, O king. They do not serve your gods, and they do not worship the golden statue that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in a furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought in, so, that, so they brought those men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods, and you do not worship the golden statue that I've set up? Now if you are ready, to, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and entire musical ensemble to fall down and worship the statue that I have made well and good. 
but if you do not worship, you shall immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire, and who is the God that will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense to you in this matter. If our God, who we serve, is able to handle, able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and out of your hand, O king, let him deliver us. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods and we will not worship the golden statue that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was so filled with rage against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that his face was distorted. He ordered the furnace heated up to seven times more than is customary and ordered some of the strongest guards in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to throw them into the furnace of blazing fire. So the men were bound, still wearing their tunics, their trousers, their hats, and other garments, and they were thrown into the furnace of blazing fire because the king's command was urgent and the furnace was so overheated heated, the raging flames killed the men who lifted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But the three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the furnace of blazing fire. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up quickly. He said to his counselors, was it not three men that we threw bound into the fire? They answered the king, true, O king. He replied, but I see four men unbound, walking in the middle of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the fourth has the appearance of a god. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the door of the furnace of blazing fire and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire, and the satraps and the prefects, the governors and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had 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 it, that the fire had not any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed. Their tunics were not harmed. Not even the smell of fire came from them. Nebuchadnezzar said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him. They, be, they disobeyed the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that utters blasphemy against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their house is laid in ruins. For there is no other God who is able to deliver in this way. Let us read responsibly from Daniel chapter 3. All the works of the Lord bless the Lord. You angels of the Lord, bless the Lord. You heavens, bless the Lord. All you powers of the Lord, bless the Lord. You sun and moon, bless the Lord. You stars of heaven, bless the Lord. You rain and dew, bless the Lord. You winds of God, bless the Lord. You fire and heat, bless the Lord. You winter and summer, bless the Lord. You dews and falling snow, bless the Lord. You frost and cold, bless the Lord. You ice and snow, bless the Lord. You nights and days, bless the Lord. You light and darkness, bless the Lord. You lightnings and clouds, bless the Lord. Let the earth bless the Lord. You mountains and hills, bless the Lord. All you green things that grow on the earth, bless the Lord. You wells and springs, bless the Lord. You seas and rivers, bless the Lord. You whales and all that swim in the waters, bless the Lord. All you birds of the air, bless the Lord. All you wild animals and cattle, bless the Lord. All you children of mortals, bless the Lord. You people of God, bless the Lord. You priests of the Lord, bless the Lord. You servants of the Lord, bless the Lord. You spirits and souls of the righteous, bless the Lord. You holy and humble in heart, bless the Lord. Let us bless the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Almighty and eternal God, the only hope of the world, by the proclamation of your prophets, 
you declare to us the word of salvation. By the grace of your Spirit, increase the devotion of all the baptized, that strengthened by your presence, we may withstand hardship and sorrow and be united with your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. A reading from Romans. Do you not know that all you have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him in baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For, we, for if we have been united with him in death like this, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like this. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed. We might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death is, no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God, so that you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. The Holy Gospel for this evening, according to John, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that, she had said these thi that he had said these things to her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace from God and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we come this evening to the end of the Triduum, the Holy Three Days. 
Maundy Thursday was the beginning of this observance, and the meal was the center of that observance, the meal that signifies Christ's Passover from, de from death to life for our sakes. Then Good Friday, last night, we observe the suffering of Christ, which brings humanity's sin to light, exposing it so that it can be healed and forgiven by God. Good Friday was also the night when the reality of death sets in. And it is on that night that the reality of Jesus' death set in for the disciples. And it is that night which we observe for ourselves that this reality is a spiritual truth for us as well. And for those of us who have come to love the Lord, His death is even more poignant in knowing that He dies for our sakes. In these three nights, we have been asking, what good is the Lord's meal? What good is the Lord's suffering? Tonight we ask, what good is the Lord's death? There is a song by a singer-songwriter named Ben Harper. It speaks of the desolation and grief that the disciple of Jesus feels when that disciple realizes that their Savior is dead. It is a song written about Good Friday. The song words go, Like the wings stolen from an angel, Like petals gone from a rose, Like a dove caught in a storm, Tonight he's in the Lord's arms. The wind, it blew straight through us And whispered to me in tongues, I was told, I was warned, Tonight he would be in the Lord's arms. Tonight he is in the Lord's arms. So I drink this wine to him with each glass a memory. He left with his crown of thorns. Tonight he is in the Lord's arms. In our current circumstances, for this holy time of year, but in this most unprecedented of circumstances and trial and tribulation for many people in our society and around the world, this image of being held in the Lord's arms should console us. Indeed, dare I say, it should even cheer us. With normal life upended, perhaps we can now more clearly hear what it is that God does for us in Jesus Christ. Maybe that is the silver lining of this time and this experience that we must go through. I take my inspiration for tonight's message from this image of being in the Lord's arms. Of course, it is a metaphor for death, and that is the sense in which Harper means it. But what does it mean to be in the Lord's arms? What is it like to be in the Lord's arms? We don't know what the dead do in the Lord's arms. Paul teaches that they are asleep until the end. Nevertheless, we often talk to our blessed dead we imagine them with us like a presence. It gives us comfort to know that our blessed dead are with God, that in God's house there are many rooms, which Jesus talks about in John chapter 14, where our blessed dead have found a home while we wait for the end, that time when we will all be together, fully, eternally, in the presence of the Lord. I have no answer for you in this regard, I am like you, sometimes talking to my blessed dead like they are with me, sometimes imagining they sleep in holy rest until the Lord awakens us all to his eternal life in the day of resurrection. What keeps me in the faith and which gladdens my heart to think of it is the hope that God is in full control of the relationship between death and eternal life. And thus that in the death of my loved ones and even my death, God's eternal life rules. God gets what God wants in the end. And if Jesus can be trusted, then he assures me that I am valuable to God. I am loved. Then I believe that that is the case for everyone when they die. But what happens when the one falling into the Lord's arms, to use Harper's phrase, what happens when the one falling, in, falling into the Lord's arms is the Lord himself? The church quickly developed the doctrine of Jesus' descent into the realm of death 
as it was variously imagined from age to age as the Greek idea of Hades or the Hebrew Sheol or Gehenna. In ancient times, people thought that the world was divided into three tiers or realms. There was heaven above, earth, which is our level of existence, and then the underworld below the level of the earth. The idea was that you were born into the world on earth and then went in death to the underworld if you had been bad and to the heavens above if you had been good. Some of Jesus' own parables use this conception to drive home a point or two about finding the proper motivation to do good versus the tendency to do bad. But Jesus' own death is different from the regular death that we experience in one important way. Jesus' death is meant to accomplish something. And for Christians, as for all religious people who believe that there is something more than death, that something has to really fix things that are broken, or resurrection after death will not work. It was not enough for the early church that Jesus would simply die, then sleep in the arms of the Lord until Easter dawn. No, something has to be accomplished in order for resurrection to be worth it. And that something has to include God's justice. There were too many loose ends in the past of human history, too many frayed and tangled strands that had to be straightened out for Jesus to simply sleep in death for three days. For the early church, those loose ends had to do with the reality of all those people from the past who never had the opportunity to see the gospel truth in Jesus or to hear his teaching and therefore never had the chance to respond to the glorious and gracious offer of salvation through faith in Christ. For others, these loose ends had to do with the eternal fate of those people who were thought to be in hell, who had done things deserving of hell, but who had also been wronged themselves, who might be said to deserve some mercy at least. Who could fix this mess? Who could rescue all of humanity from the sin they commit while doing justice to their victims and the circumstances in which they sinned? Thus, two early passages of Scripture mention Jesus' descent into the realm of the dead while he is dead. The first letter of Peter, chapter 4, verse 6, states that in Christ good tidings were proclaimed to the dead. And in St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 9, it says that Christ descended into the lower parts of the earth. Clearly, this was an early belief of the church. And there are other verses that seem to support this view. The church then came to confess this aspect of Jesus' ministry and death when it included the phrases, He descended into hell in the Apostles' Creed. So from an early time, the church confessed that when Jesus died on Good Friday evening, A, like all humans, He really died, and B, unlike all humans, He got to work in the realm of death to undo the power and work of the devil. If you go to our Facebook page and view the banner across the top of our church Facebook page, you will see an old depiction that is painted on the ceiling of a church in Turkey that depicts this Jesus' descent into hell. Now, there is a long history of debate in the church about how significant this teaching of Christ's descent is to the faith. My purpose tonight is not to review all that. For Lutherans, ever since the Reformation began 500 years ago, we have held to the basic doctrinal position as stated in the ancient creed. The formula of Concord, one of the official confessional documents of the, seventh, of the 16th century that articulated Lutheran positions on Christian faith, states, we believe simply that the entire person of Jesus descended to hell after his burial, conquered the devil, destroyed the power of hell, and took from the devil all his power. What I want to emphasize for you tonight is the significance of this confession for our faith and for how we live our lives with hope in God's full salvation. We haven't spoken of the devil much in our Holy Week observance or in our Maundy Thursday or Good Friday sermons, but the idea of the power of evil is intimately part of our faith and of our understanding of what Jesus accomplishes for us in his death and resurrection. 
Whether we believe that the devil is real or simply an abstract personification of evil, we can agree that evil is a powerful force in the world. Are there evil things that happen to people? Yes. Are there people who do evil things? Yes. Can political or social or economic systems be evil? Certainly. How does God judge evil in us and the world? Conventional ideas about religion say that this is from the Bible, the idea that God judges evil in people and then punishes them. Or we might even say that God judges evil people by consigning them to everlasting torment in hell. That is, God sees evil, judges it to be against his will, and then punishes it. After all, that's what hell is for, right? And for the most part, we find comfort in this view because it supplies our worldview with a basic understanding of cause and effect, or call it karma, or a system of cosmic justice. There are those who sin, and then there are those who really sin. And for those of us who have our ticket to heaven, who we are grateful that we have asked for forgiveness. But those who do not or cannot or do participate in evil and are unrepentant, they are damned. It's a neat and tidy little system. However, this is an unsatisfying system of belief, for we know more and more now these days about what makes people tick and that people are not in full control of themselves all the time. We know this about ourselves, for we know what it's like to try and change our behaviors, especially our bad habits, for the better. But we are coming to know this about other people as well, people who seem to choose to do bad or somehow can't help it. Thus the conventional religious idea of evil or the devil having control over people carries some weight. But as research and science continue to explain the grip that imbalances or tendencies or chemical abnormalities in the brain have on our behavior and thinking, we continue to gain knowledge about the problem of the human will. The will has now been forced to share responsibility in our view of human behavior with our own subconscious motivations and the very mysterious ways in which our brains have been hardwired either from internal development or because of past experiences or environmental factors. Think of what we know now about chemical or environmental exposures on brain development, traumatic experiences, PTSD, early deficiencies, abuse or neglect, not to mention inherited tendencies, mental illness and pathology. Anymore, I can't find a way to fully blame people who commit heinous crimes or act sinfully as a matter of habit or obsession or addiction. For we don't know how much evil behavior is really shaped by our willpower alone. In the past, before the real revolution in brain science gave us this new perspective, all of these powerful tendencies, habits, addictions, etc., are what we might have called evil or the demonic, and that behind their mysterious power was the devil himself, causing humans to go against the will of God. Now, knowing what we know about the human brain, we need a different vision of who God is. For the God who would continue, despite this knowledge, to judge sinful and evil acts by putting pulling the trap door under each offender as they fall into eternal damnation is a pretty heartless God. Furthermore, a hell full of sorry souls whose willpower wasn't up to snuff couldn't possibly be satisfying because it implies a God who is ultimately powerless to do anything about the real bonds and captivities that people actually suffer from. Put in terms of the conventional language, what kind of salvation can we expect from a God who can't undo the devil's hooks? Either that God is heartless, for he ultimately doesn't care about the details of human sin, or that God, that God is truly powerless to do anything about it. And I'm sorry, folks, but that God is no God at all. But thanks be to God, for the God we believe in, the Lord of creation, the deliverer of, e of Israel, whose word goes forth from his mouth and does not return empty, 
who redeems our life from the fiery furnace. This God has the power, even in death, to descend to the lowest reaches of human experience, into death itself, and in that space of moral and physical desolation, actually open doors, break chains, and lift up those who have lost the fight against their inner demons. Thanks be to God that Jesus is so committed to being the Good Shepherd that He walks right into the clutches of the wolves that prey on all His lost sheep. At first, the wolf may even think he has won the victory, but the power of God's life, even in the clutches of death, overwhelms the powers arrayed against God. Christ can truly be called our champion, as Luther says in the first two verses of his famous hymn. A mighty fortress is our God, a sword and shield victorious. He breaks the cruel oppressor's rod and wins salvation glorious. The old satanic foe has sworn to work us woe. With craft and dreadful might, he arms himself to fight. On earth he has no equal. No strength of ours can match his might. We would be lost, rejected. But now a champion comes to fight whom God himself elected. You ask who this may be. The Lord of hosts is he. Christ Jesus, mighty Lord, God's only Son adored. He holds the field victorious. So brothers and sisters, Raise the strain, sing your alleluias, for Christ has come for all, and all have been redeemed. The gates of hell cannot keep him out, for Christ tears the gates asunder and brings heaven to the damned. Are there some who refuse this offer? Are there those who prefer the devil's bid? Perhaps for a moment, but can you imagine staying behind in your tormentor's lair when your tormentor himself has been led away in chains? And what of those who deserve that punishment, whose acts have caused mountains of suffering and grief? Isn't hell the justice they deserve? Not if God's will all along is for the justice of reconciliation. For it could be that true justice is victim and perpetrator reconciled around the truth of their actions in the eyes of God being forced to reconcile with their victims would mean to accept God's judgment on, heaven, on human evil and also accept God's will for good. And you can't have such reconciliation without someone going and fetching the parties to bring them together. This is the work of Christ in His holy death. This is the work of Christ on this holy Saturday. And if Christ has the power to open hell to heaven then this points to one glorious truth that in the end, God will get what God wants. Praise and glory be to God. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters, let us now participate in the affirmation of holy baptism. As we keep vigil on this most holy night, we give thanks for the gift of baptism and come before God to make public affirmation of baptism into Christ. Let us pray. Merciful God, we thank you that you have made us your own by water and the word in baptism. You have called us to Yourself, enlightened us with the gifts of Your Spirit, and nourished us in the community of faith. Uphold us and all Your servants in the gifts and promises of baptism, and unite the hearts of all whom You have brought with new birth. We ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I ask you to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, reject sin, and confess the faith of the church. Do you renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God? We, we renounce, renounce them. them. Do you renounce the powers of this world that rebel against God? We, we renounce, renounce them. them. Do you renounce the ways of sin that draw you from God? 
we, we renounce them. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. People of God, you have professed your faith. Do you intend to continue in the covenant of God made with you in holy baptism, to live among God's faithful people, to hear the word of God and share in the Lord's Supper, to proclaim the good news of God in Christ through word and deed, to serve all people following the example of Jesus, and to strive for justice and peace in all the earth. We, we do, do and, and we ask God, God to help and guide us. us. People of God, do you promise to support and pray for each other in your life in Christ? We, we do, do, and, and we, we ask God, God to help and guide us. us. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, that through water and the Holy Spirit you give us new birth. Cleanse us from sin and raise us to eternal life. Stir up in your people the gift of your Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also, and also with you. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us now pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forever and ever. Amen. A very merry and happy Easter to you all, from all of us at the Lutheran Church of the Redeemer, to all of you in uh, your homes and among your families. We ask God's richest blessings for you. We keep in mind those whom we are praying for, for those who are falling ill and those who have died. And we ask that in this season of Easter, we pray continuously for relief from this epidemic that we are experiencing. But in Easter joy, we remember that Christ is with us, present to us in his risen life, and that that life extends for us from now through eternity. Be sure to join us tomorrow morning for our Easter service, Easter morning service at 10.30 a.m. 10.30 a.m. live stream here on Facebook. And you will find in the email that you received today also the, uh, the worship guide for Easter service tomorrow, the flower form that has the list of flower donations and the announcements for the coming week as well. For those of you who wish to find the, uh, the uh, worship guide for tomorrow's service, you can go to our Facebook page, our website, www.redeemerramsey.org. Now receive the blessing. May God, who has brought us from death to life, fill you with great joy. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. We sing our sending hymn, Christ the Lord is risen today. Alleluia. <laughs>
Christ is risen risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia. Alleluia. You are the body of Christ raised up for the world. Go in peace. Share the good news. Thanks Thanks be be to to God. God.